You all know about the statistics, but I speak a lot and I use this because I want people to realize that it's not just about the numbers, that every single one of these people in this stadium is a real person, is a son, a daughter, a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, an uncle, a neighbor. And so we're not just talking about statistics, we are talking about real Americans and real Tennesseans. If Commissioner Williams were here from the Commissioner from the Department of Mental Health, she would say by the end of today we will have lost four more Tennesseans. And so I literally get up every single day and think about what can I be doing? What can the court system be doing that will help this present opioid epidemic? Um, so one of the things that people think about is that we have all these drug courts all over the state, and we do have a lot of drug courts, but they are very, very expensive to run. The other thing that started happening was judges were calling me from all kinds of jurisdictions. So you all can imagine, people who are using, um, get evicted from their apartments, they have to go to court because of bad medical debt. There are all kinds of issues, divorce, we've already heard about foster care, losing your children, having them removed, workers' comp insurance. So basically, every type of judge and court in the country is being impacted. And of course, the, the thing that really tugs at all of our hearts are the real impact on children and families across this country and here in Tennessee as well. So you all can see some of those statistics. Um, I know that Dr. Patrick and Vanderbilt has done, have, have been doing a lot of studies about drug mortality and foster care entry rates, about issues of poverty, about people who are living in rural areas and their lack of access. So again, just more information that you all can access if you are out talking to people, if you are raising money for a program or a project, if you're involved with a nonprofit in your area. And then we thought grandparents would be the solution, right? We'll just remove the child, we'll put them with the grandparent. I sent a group of judges to Ohio, and this overdose of the grandparents happened the weekend my judges were at a training with a little seven-year-old boy in the back seat and dead grandparents. So you all are really on the front lines. You all know more, as I said, than I will ever know about all of the impacts of the opioid epidemic on our infant, infants and our children. Um, one of the unexpected things is that women are spending more time in jail even when they have been arrested on the exact same offenses as a male counterpart or their spouse or boyfriend. And so I'm very excited that the governor is going to be including funding in his budget. I hope you all will follow this because this may be a place for people from all over the state, for moms, for women, and for pregnant women to be able to come. Some of you all may be familiar with some of these facilities, but if you don't know about them, I hope you will get to know them. Um, back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, I was representing a lot of moms and kids in court. And at that time, we had a crack cocaine epidemic. I just said, this is not working anymore. One of the juvenile judges has been saying the same thing. We were all just kind of keeping a tally of how many children were being removed and from their mothers. At that time, there was no place here in Nashville for them to go, and so we started something called Renewal House. Now, as you all can imagine, it's the opioid crisis. I know there are over 60 women right now on that waiting list, and so we are really hoping to be able to expand that. And then there's some other nonprofits around the state, as you all can see. So I hope if you don't know them yet, that you will get to know these places. So the National Judicial Opioid Task Force. Two years ago, we realized that judges really are at the center, at the epicenter. It's almost a crisis within a crisis inside the court system. 
We don't even have access to the limited funds that you all have. Funding, for the most part, as you all know, comes down through state departments, and the judges have never been a part of that. So we decided that we needed to put together resources for our judges. I have left copies of some of these, and they are all free on our website, and so I know that all of this will be posted for you all. One of the great things about these is if you all are out speaking to organizations or just in your own particular hospital settings and want to share these, I'm very proud of a lot of the materials that we have put together. Again, we started doing this for judges. Then what we realized was that all of these resources can be used for anything. I had a judge who took about 200 copies to a civic club because he wanted to be able to start educating his community. Um, again, we divided up into groups, and as you all can imagine, children and families probably has more of these resources than any other um, group did that we put together. So I hope that you all will take a look at those. There are a few that I want to highlight specifically. Um, another group spent their time on civil and criminal justice. And then finally, collaboration and education. So specifically for you all, I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of these. This one, for many of you all, is about uh, substance exposure for pregnant moms. And one of the things that I wanted to specifically tell you all about happens to be on uh, page five of that particular one. Um, as we all know, this impacts not only the mother, but obviously also the baby as well. And so I hope that you all will um, take time to take a look at some of these because I think that they not only are like the modules that you all are taking, but also give you examples about pilot projects and promising practices that are going on across the country. On page five of that particular one, there is um, the Clinical Guidance for Treating Pregnant and Parenting Women with OUD. And one of the program snapshots that um, I'm very proud about, uh, proud of, is actually the Department of Health here in Tennessee, so thank you all, working with our judges up in East Tennessee. And we were able to get the local sheriffs to transport moms for free to the local health department, have medical exams done for free, then to give them contraceptive education, and then free contraception. And so uh, I want to make sure that I told you all, after the pilot project in Sevier County, the county noted a 57% reduction in NAS cases compared to the previous year. So thank you all. So one of the exciting things is these materials were created for a national audience, but I get to go around the country and talk about many of the pilot projects that are happening right here in Tennessee. One, I think it's because we have such a great collaborative spirit. And in that particular example, we were able to bring sheriffs and judges together to talk about many of the issues that are not only <coughs> impacting them, but costing their budget a lot of money. So why, on one hand, are the sheriffs interested in this? Because the fewer beds that they are paying for in jail, um, the, the less that their budget is negatively impacted. So I think there's so many positive things that are coming out of really the worst epidemic that our country has ever seen. But it's because we're all being forced to work together. So I'm sure that many of you all, unless you've been particularly involved in a safe baby court, probably don't think about having judges at a meeting or inviting somebody from the court system. But that's exactly the message that I want to bring to you all today. So I hope that when you all go home, you make sure that you know the judges in your area and that you do involve them and that you do get involved in many of the projects that we have going on. If you haven't heard about them before, there is a project called the ECHO Project. It's been in a lot of states. But Vermont has been highly successful with that. As you can imagine, that is like link 
linking specialists who are the hub to spokes out all across the um, entire state, maybe in very, very rural areas. This is another example of being able to use all the different exciting, innovative technologies, telemedicine, iPads, all of those kinds of technologies to get linked up with the specialist. One of the grants that I'm trying to fund is what I'm calling like doc on call so that our judges, if they actually had two different recommendations coming before them, could actually take a break, go off the bench, and have a doc that was actually on call to talk through some of those issues. As you all know, Families First Act, the new act that Senator Alexander, our senator from here, um, who used to be a former governor, this is the first time in history that the funding can be used on the prevention side. So again, I would really urge you all to find out how to access that. Um, here are some other things that we are trying to do in addition to the safe baby courts that you heard about, we're trying to also have community court and teen court. So we back down earlier and earlier in the process. The first time that a young person ever comes in contact with law enforcement or with the court system to try to, at that point, start inserting, inserting some prevention um, programming. We have a faith and justice initiative with several hundred partners, so does the Department of Mental Health. Probably the Department of Health does as well. So I think one of the things that we forgot, forget about is what an incredible uh, support system and um, uh, volunteer place that our faith partners can be. One of the programs that we administer has to do with visitation, and so we're hoping to connect more churches so that they can support visitation. I'm very excited that we, for the first time ever, have a justice liaison with Tinker so that we can actually go to them and say, here are some problems this judge is seeing in Sevier County, for instance, um, and so that we can try to cut some of the red tape Ten Care wants to know when their contracts are not being fulfilled. So I'm very excited about that possibility, and I hope that that will end up helping you all as well. Um, again, our safe baby courts, uh, the mentoring of aging out foster kids, again, trying to have them connect with someone who has already been through the system. Um, so. This is not a setup picture. This is Judge Dwayne Sloan. I don't know if any of you all are from Upper East Tennessee. He is receiving in two weeks um, the National Judge of the Year Award from Chief Justice John Roberts at the US Supreme Court, and we are so excited. And so this is what he does every time he has safe baby court or every time that he has a mom who's pregnant in his drug court. He actually has them, as they continue to come for aftercare checks, to bring their babies, and he actually holds them up on the bench. So he is just a remarkable judge, and I have to say there are many, many many, many of those judges these days. Very, very proud of them. So interestingly, this kind of reflects one of the maps that was just up. So I hope that all of you all who are in those areas already know about your safe baby court. And if you don't, please call me. You all have all my information. And I can connect you with the judge who is running that particular safe baby court. But we need your referrals. We want to have a relationship with you. And one day, uh, the legislature is hoping that we're going to have these all across the entire state. We, along with Florida, are the only state who is moving toward a statewide program for safe baby courts. Again, just another example of all the partnerships. If any of these are, if you all are in a county with these, please let me know. I'm happy to connect you all with them as well. Obviously, um, here are a few more examples. Again, very excited that Tennessee's Healthy Babies Program is being focused on at the national level and is an example that other states are already hoping to emulate. Um, 
this is very interesting because this is in Pennsylvania um, where they are really trying to get the entire family to be engaged, somewhat like our safe baby courts, so that the entire family is kind of swept up at the same time. Um, one of the important things, too, is the response time so that immediately if there has been an overdose situation, um, if someone is getting out of jail, that within 24 or 72 hours as soon as possible to send a team out. You all may know that West Virginia has one of the highest overdose rates in the entire nation, and so this is something that has been highly successful. A nurse or a doctor, a mental health person, a plainclothes policeman goes to somebody's door because you think that's when they're at the lowest of the low to provide services for them. Uh, some of you all, has anybody been trained on the sequential intercept model? This is an incredible model because what it does, and the judges, I'd never heard of it, usually it's in a healthcare or mental health care setting. But what it does is every place along the way that we can insert ourselves, our programs, our courts. What's really interesting is that while it was being rolled out, SAMHSA and HHS really realized that it shouldn't start with one, but it should start all the way back at zero. And so that's why I try to tell my judges a lot that we would love to get people, children for instance, at a pre-petition um, point. And so we are piloting a pre-petition before any petition is ever filed so that the judge can start getting services to those families. Um, in Indiana, their chief justice hosted teams from every single county. They they were trained on the sequential intercept model and they wrote a plan and took the plan back to every single county. Again, multidisciplinary teams that are working together sometimes for the first time ever. Again, so important that we try to increase the access to treatment. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up, I was also fortunate, I served on a national task force with Legal Services Corporation. Um, anybody here from Le Bonheur? You all actually have a medical legal partnership located in the hospital. So when a nurse is talking to a family and they are saying, we don't know where we're going to take the child home because we just got evicted, there is actually a legal medical team that tries to help those families right there, right then, before they um, actually depart from the hospital to get them into safe, sober housing. Um, so this is something that we are very very, very excited about trying to expand here. And speaking about that zero intercept model, I don't know if you all have seen these uh, videos from Sesame Street, but I thought they might be excellent, um, again, tools for you all to use with families. This is a slide that I try to that I try to insert when I go out and talk to civic clubs or nonprofits. It's just, what are you doing for others? And you all are doing something every day. Um, but I hope that you will keep judges and the court system in the back of your mind now that you've heard a lot about what we are doing. Um, and so that you know that we want to partner with you all. In many places, we already are partners. But if we aren't, and if you don't know the judge or the safe baby court, um, please let us know because we would love to become more involved. So thank you all. Hope you'll go on. There are literally a hundred resources and I would uh, really encourage you all to use those as you wish and just thank you for the time.